There's another piece to this. Participation in this joint process has provided our NELC representatives at all levels with the opportunity to educate ourselves about management systems such as tax, DOAS, core, as well as to discover when and where management unfairly manipulates work hours and other key data. This education is invaluable to us, whether we're working together in a joint process or whether we're pursuing grievances on route inspections and adjustments. Because, brothers and sisters, knowledge is power. So thanks to your hard work, we have indeed empowered letter carriers and branch leaders in the process of route adjustments. We also believe that the new route adjustment process offers an excellent model for the future of postal labor relations. It shows that even in the most extreme circumstances, with the collapse of the male intensive finance and housing sectors, that dialogue and good faith bargaining aimed at win-win solutions do provide the best approach for the future. Our fourth and final goal in the realm of bargaining is to prepare for the next round of contract negotiations. Now, given the extraordinary set of economic circumstances facing the Postal Service, it's no exaggeration to say that the next round of bargaining will be the most difficult in our history. This week, we will entertain and debate a wide variety of national agreement resolutions, as we always do. And as always, this debate is crucial for the future of our union. But this round of contract talks will be anything but business as usual. We must be prepared to go beyond the usual debate about bargaining demands. Therefore, later today, I'm going to propose that we block out some time in the schedule on Thursday to have an open-ended discussion about our approach to negotiating a new contract. As the chair, I want to outline some of the choices we face in collective bargaining. And then I want to open all the floor microphones to the delegates that want to make comments or suggestions on the issues that are raised, sort of like we do when we have our, our wrap sessions every other year. All right, if you don't want to, we won't. <laughs> Our goals for this special discussion will be twofold. To better understand the challenges that we face and the options that we have as we head into a new round of contract talks. And to give the delegates a chance to provide guidance to the Executive Council on these options or to suggest others. And I look forward to a serious and interesting discussion on Thursday. Let me be upfront and unambiguous about one thing, however, and you can chip this one in stone. NALC is 100 percent committed to fight to protect, protect the job security and standard of living of letter carriers, no matter what economic conditions we face. Our legitimate place in the middle class was achieved over several decades of struggle, and we will not give it up. <laughs> LaFont Plaza, if you are listening, and I know you are, pay attention. If the Postal Service approaches bargaining in good faith and with creativity, it will have a willing partner. If it respects the central role of letter carriers in the future business model and the sacrifices that letter carriers have already made to help the service survive the crisis, we will have productive talks. But if the Postal Service approaches bargaining with the goal of gutting our pay and benefits or tries to exploit the national economic crisis by making demands for sharp cuts and givebacks, 
you will have a bloody fight on your hands. I think we're on the same page. We are prepared to be creative, but we are not prepared to fall on our swords. Ain't going to happen. Now, the labor relations revolution that I spoke of earlier, a couple hours ago, is a fragile one. At a time of great economic stress, the temptation by management to abandon good faith bargaining for the path of confrontation is ever present. Regardless of the choice it makes, we will be prepared either way. Now, bargaining is not the only way that NALC fights for letter carriers. As you know all too well, we also fight for them every day on the political and legislative battlegrounds. Electing pro-letter carrier and pro-labor candidates from both parties and lobbying Congress to protect our pensions, health care, and our other benefits is a central part of what we do as a union. Now, going forward, this work is going to become more important because we need Congress and the Obama administration to do their part to help the Postal Service survive, not only the current crisis, but to adapt to the evolving needs of the American economy in the Internet age. Let us turn to this important area of activity. At our last convention, we set our sights on two overriding goals, strengthening the Postal Service and reviving the middle class in the American economy, because they both share a common purpose, which is what? To advance the well-being of city letter carriers. We must bolster the Postal Service to protect the job security of our active members, and we must rebuild the middle class to protect the standard of living of all letter carriers whose pay and benefits are subject to a standard of private sector comparability. Now, candidly, we still have corners of our membership that have a problem with those goals. They say, why strengthen the Postal Service? Isn't that our enemy? They say, why worry about rebuilding the middle class in America? Let's worry about letter carriers, not about other workers in other industries. Now, I believe we have successfully answered those questions. But to be sure, since we have all day and all night, let's do it again as we reaffirm those goals. First, only a strong United States Postal Service can continue to provide stable employment with decent pay and benefits to 200,000 letter carriers. That's not just rhetoric. It's plain, unvarnished, here and now, political and financial common sense. Second, only a nation with a strong national middle class of tens of millions of workers with decent pay and benefits will tolerate or support public employees, letter carriers, as a necessity. We are not now, we do not aspire to be, we will not be allowed to be a small elite of well-protected workers while the rest of the American workforce goes to hell in a handbasket. It's not going to happen.
This week, we will recommit ourselves to the goals of a strong postal service and a revived middle class. Let's talk about both. There's two essential steps to saving the postal service in the near term. We must permanently reform the retiree health prefunding provisions of the 2006 Postal Reform Law. And we must save the service from itself by defeating its proposed elimination of Saturday delivery. Let me start with the prefunding. I want to ask for a show of hands, as if I could see you with the lights in my eyes. How many of you have been to a state convention, a regional rap session, or some other NALC event over the past two years and had to endure a PowerPoint presentation from me or one of the other national officers on the utterly fascinating topic of retiree health prefunding. We do get around. Okay. For those of you who have raised your hands, I got good news for you. I will not torture you again with another dose of actuarial mumbo jumbo today. For those of you who didn't raise your hands, don't worry. One of us will be back to torture you soon enough. Both my daughters have had to sit through it, haven't traveled with me since. This very complicated topic can be summed up as follows. That's normally about a three and a half hour presentation. I think we can do it in two. <laughs> the Postal Service is the only government agency or private company in America required to pre-fund future retiree benefits at a cost of five and a half billion dollars per year instead of just paying the costs as they arise each year like everybody else in the world does. The schedule of prefunding payments, which was heavy enough when it was adopted in 2006, became absolutely unaffordable when the economy crashed. And it became unnecessary when two independent studies confirmed that the Office of Personnel Management had shortchanged the postal account within the Civil Service Retirement System Pension Fund by between 50 and $75 billion. That's enough money to fully prefund all future health benefits of present and future postal retirees, and enough to wipe out the postal deficit. So now, Congress has got to enact legislation to transfer our pension surplus from the Civil Service Retirement Fund to the Postal Retiree Health Fund. And it must also repeal that prefunding schedule. 